Hello, and thank you for joining me. Today, I would like to discuss a number of matters pertaining to the war in Ukraine. First of all, Russian nuclear weapons and Belarus. Even before the Kremlin took the decision to deploy nuclear weapons on Belarusian soil, Belarus came under the Russian nuclear umbrella. Indeed, with the exception of the Baltic states of Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania, all of the territory of the former Soviet Union comes under the Russian nuclear umbrella. That has been the case ever since the dissolution of the Soviet Union in December of 1991 to the present day. So why has the Kremlin taken the decision to deploy Russian nuclear weapons in Belarus? Well, first of all, it is in response to a very rapid and substantial increase of NATO forces along the western border of the Russian Federation, something which is a violation of the NATO-Russia founding treaty of 1997. Secondly, the Kremlin has taken the decision as a result of very aggressive rhetoric by the Polish government towards Belarus. Now, why is that a threat to Russia? Because of the existence of the Union State of Russia and Belarus, which was formulated between 1997 and 1999. Now, a threat to Belarus is a threat to Russia, and a threat to Russia is a threat to Belarus. So, again, as a result of aggressive talk emanating from Warsaw towards Belarus, the Russians have taken the decision to deploy nuclear weapons on Belarusian soil. And thirdly, what we are seeing at present is the birth of a new and enlarged Russia. And I am not just talking about the territories in Ukraine, which have already been absorbed by the Russian Federation. And of course, I am specifically referring to Donetsk Oblast, Lugansk Oblast, Zaboroshi Oblast, and Kherson Oblast. I am also referring to Belarus because it is very clear that sooner rather than later, Belarus will reunify with Russia. And as a result of this reality, which is unfolding, Russia has taken the decision to deploy its nuclear weapons in Belarus. Now, we are hearing from Western governments and Western mainstream media that the decision by Russia to deploy nuclear weapons in Belarus is an aggressive move. However, Western mainstream media and Western governments are silent concerning how America has nuclear weapons in Belgium, the Netherlands, Germany, Italy, and Turkey. So, whilst I personally do not wish to see any country in the world in possession of nuclear weapons, it is quite rich for America and its allies in Europe to condemn the move by Russia to deploy nuclear weapons in Belarus, when already Europe is host to American nuclear warheads. Now, the next matter I would like to comment upon is the decision of the International Criminal Court to indict Vladimir Putin. 
Now, I say the decision of the ICC in a very loose way, because it wasn't actually the decision of the countries in the world which have signed up to the ICC, no. It was actually a decision engineered by the West. All we need do is investigate who the main donors to the ICC are in order to determine which countries in the world are able to influence the decisions that the ICC makes. So the decision or the so-called decision of the ICC to indict Putin is nothing more than a propaganda move by the West, a way to demonize Vladimir Putin and demonize Russia even further. However, there is nothing more to the decision of the ICC than that. Even though Western governments engineered the decision, nonetheless, those same governments, such as the British one, will maintain a distance from the decision because otherwise this risks the West jeopardizing its channels of communication with the Kremlin. We have to remember that despite the political, economic, military, cultural, and information war being waged at present by the West against Russia, diplomatic relations between Western countries and Russia remain in place, and that we should applaud, and that we should be thankful for, because Russia is a nuclear superpower, and the largest and most, and most powerful nuclear superpower in the world. So that is why, despite the West having engineered the decision of the ICC to indict Putin, nonetheless, they will keep a, diff a distance from the decision because they do not risk, they do not wish to risk jeopardizing their lines of communication with the Kremlin because that is one way that a war, a conventional war, could emerge between the West and Russia. Furthermore, the ICC, whilst the concept behind it is a noble one, unfortunately has been penetrated and subverted by certain Western countries and is used, is yielded, is wielded as a political weapon. And that is most reg regrettable because as I said, the concept behind the ICC is a good one. It is a, a, a noble one. However, if the ICC was genuinely an impartial court, then why has it never indicted, for instance, Bill Clinton or Madeleine Albright or George Bush Jr or Tony Blair or Gordon Brown because after all the aforementioned people are some of the worst war criminals that the world has known in recent times. Indeed the deaths that the aforesaid people have caused in total is simply mind boggling. But the ICC has never indicted them, even though, for example, Madeleine Albright openly said in an interview with an American news outlet in the mid 1990s that American sanctions are worth the price of 500,000 Iraqi children having died. 
And even though Bill Clinton and Tony Blair and Gordon Brown and, of course, George Bush Jr. waged a war of aggression against Iraq, which caused the deaths of over one million Iraqi civilians, the ICC has never indicted those men. And we can also talk about NATO's illegal war of aggression against the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia in 1999, which involved NATO using uh, depleted uranium shells and bombs against the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, which of course was comprised of Serbia and Montenegro. Now, that reality is one of the worst crimes against humanity imaginable. And yet, Bill Clinton, Tony Blair, and Gordon Brown have never been indicted by the ICC. The final matter I would like to discuss concerns the Battle of Bakhmut. Unlike for Western governments and Western mainstream media, coupled with the Ukrainian government, from day one of the battle, I have been consistent in my opinion that the Battle of Bakhmut, or Artemovsk, which is its proper historical name, is a battle of immense strategic importance. Why? Because not only will a Russian victory at at Bakhmut enable the Russian army to advance further in the uh, western part of the Donetsk Oblast, but it will also enable the Russians to advance into the oblasts of Dnipro Vachosk and Kharkov, which is certainly something that the Russian high command are planning to do and will do. Also, the Battle of Bakhmut has been a immense strategic failure for the Ukrainian government and the Ukrainian armed forces. Thousands upon thousands upon thousands of the Ukrainian army's best soldiers have perished in the Battle of Bakhmut. It is no exaggeration to say that well in excess of 10,000 Ukrainian soldiers have died in the Battle of Bakhmut. And as I said just now, Those soldiers comprised the very best of the Ukrainian army's um, fighting forces. So once the Russian army emerges victorious in Bakhmut, which will happen sooner rather than later, then the picture will be very clear that the Russian army will have carried out essentially a meat grinder at Bakhmut, which will have severely weakened the Ukrainian army as a whole. And what will greet or what will meet the Russian army in the rest of the Donetsk Oblast, and then when the Russian army enters the Oblast of Dnipro Petrovsk, and Kharkov will be soldiers who will be incomparable to Ukrainian soldiers who will be incomparable to their predecessors who perished in Bakhmut. So again, the Battle of Bakhmut is of immense strategic importance. And it is only now that, for example, Western mainstream media is saying that the battle is of strategic importance. Before they downplayed the battle, well, if we go back months ago, when Western mainstream media claimed that Bakhmut was of no strategic importance, I, for example, countered that by saying, if the battle is of no strategic importance, then why has 
the Ukrainian government poured thousands upon thousands of its best soldiers into the battle. It is quite simple. If a battle is of no strategic importance to an army, then it will not fight it, or it will, um, it will fight it to an extent, but it will certainly not pour into the battle its finest soldiers. So once the Russians emerge victorious at Bakhmut, this will constitute a turning point in the war. And no matter what Western uh, uh, governments send to Ukraine in the form of military hardware, they will not be able to replace those thousands upon thousands upon thousands of Ukrainian soldiers who have perished at Bakhmut. Because those soldiers were trained by NATO instructors unofficially from 2014 up until the Russian army entered Ukraine in February of 2022. So what the Russian army will meet on the battlefield elsewhere in Ukraine after the Russians are victorious at Bakhmut will be soldiers who, as I said just now, who will be inco incomparable in standards, in training, in overall quality to those who perished at Bakhmut. In short, they will be substandard soldiery. Thank you very much for taking the time to listen to my analysis today. And I aim to produce such videos in the foreseeable future. Again, thank you very much for your time.